Hi everyone, this is Dr Gay Lindsay and I'm really pleased to be presenting um, to you today to talk to you about arts in early childhood. I'm based south of Sydney, so I'll just share my screen with you and we'll get started. So today we're going to be thinking about what art making processes are most important for children. Oops, sorry. I'd like to extend my thanks to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. It's a really exciting opportunity to bring speakers from all around the world to share with you as you um, focus on your children, which is the most important thing any of us can do. So as we go through, if you think of a question you'd like to ask, please just pop it into the chat and we'll have time at the end to um, hopefully address some of your questions. And I'll do that after the half hour presentation. And I've also provided a handout which you'll have access to, which includes some of the key points from my talk, but also some further links to support your reflection. To give you a little ba background about my, the area I live in south of Sydney, it's the Wollongong area. And in Australia, when we commence a presentation, we like to pay our respects to, th to the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet, even though we're all meeting in very different places um, this morning. So I do pay my res respects to elders past, present and future, and extend my respects to any Aboriginal or First Peoples First Nations people who are with us today. Also a little bit of background so you know where I'm coming from um, in my career and my work. I've worked in early childhood settings uh, for more than 22 years and then been in the um, tertiary education sector as an academic for almost 10 years now. So I worked um, predominantly with young children in my local community during that time, but now I teach the teachers. So I'm a lecturer in the uh, School of Education at the University of Wollongong with the early years degree students and get, got my uh, PhD a few years ago now where I focused on visual arts in early childhood. So that's my area of passion and it's led me to do some really exciting research around the world, um, working with teachers of young children and with parents uh, in the Middle East region around ensuring that our children end up with the best quality experiences we can offer them. And in the middle of the screen, you can see um, during this time of COVID shutdown, I, I've been trying to practice what I preach and do some artwork each week to sort of sustain my own well-being. And so I'd encourage you to embrace the arts with your children because they can be the, the fount of well-being and the source of inspiration. So in our presentation today, we'll explore thinking about creativity and the benefits of playing in an artful way. We'll think about the rights of children with additional support needs, or as you call children with these rights in the Middle East, children of determination. Are we hearing and respecting the child's voice is something that we'll also focus on. And we'll think about some um, possibilities around playful and artful engagement that honours children and their rights. There are many benefits of art-centred experience and you know, research acro across the last few decades has shown us that when children engage in arts, quality arts experiences, they um, benefit from holistic and contextual learning contexts. It promotes a respectful image of the child as the author of their own learning journey. It's, it leads to motivation and enjoyment, positive attitudes to learning are fostered when children can engage in joyful, artful play experiences. But it also supports problem solving and cognition. So, you know, the, the capacity to think through and problem solve issues. Children are supported to develop self-regulation and self-discipline when they play this way. It fosters creativity and imagination and also physical skills and physical development um, capacities. 
and it also positions the arts as a tool for communication and making meaning. But the research also shows us that these benefits only exist when effective and quality provisions are made by the educators that children are working with or by their families, by the adults that they're interacting with. So I just really want to highlight today that it's your role as a parent or as an educator or both that is what actually determines the quality of the experiences that children are offered and benefit from. So if we think about conditions for stimulating children's creativity, much research tells us that these are the sorts of areas we need to think about. We need to think about the experience itself. Where is it social? Is it participatory? So that means that you know, we learn much more when we're learning in collaboration with other people and in relationships with other people. The environment needs to be considered so that it's open-ended. What that means is that we're not forcing children to do structured tasks, but we're offering them environments in which they get to make choices and be agents and um, agents and active learners. We're offering them intelligent environments and intelligent play materials. And again, what I mean by that is that the materials we offer children should have multiple potentials rather than only um, serving one goal or one product or one aim. We want to foster independence so that when children engage in learning experiences, they're self-driven, where they're engaging in active learning rather than being passive in the learning experience. And we also want the adult in that exchange to facilitate children's learning, but not necessarily to be hand over hand and forcing them. Although ironically in the photo you see, the adult is encouraging and that's a facilitation role. It's not a forcing role, but it's a guiding and supporting or a suggesting role. We need to allow for time for new knowledge to develop. And new knowledge needs to be built upon previous or existing experiences and knowledge. And so unless we do that, then the learning experience is out of context and it can be quite meaningless for the child. And we need to allow time for children to develop the skills um, and develop a relationship with the materials that they're using so that their first encounter can be one of just meeting a material without any kind of pressure to produce an outcome. So we need time, just as we as adults need time to get to know an experience and um, a new material if we're learning something new. We don't become experts at it on the first use. We need lots and lots of opportunities and time to develop skills and learning. And in terms of place, it sort of aligns a bit with environment but it's about creating those special spaces for children where their imagination can flourish, where they can hide away sometimes when they can escape the pressures of the world. And space isn't just physical, it's actually um, a, a way of being with children, that we're creating a place, a space for children where their desires and their interests are paramount. So there's so many choices um, when it comes to art in early childhood. And I like to call it art and craft and everything in between. But what's important is that as the adults making those decisions about the learning experiences of children, that we think about what will honour the child. You know, there's so many choices, but some of the choices involve adult hands more than they involve children's hands. And so today's presentation will hopefully um, provide you with some, some ideas that will support your thinking around, well, what is the, you know, not that there's a right or a wrong choice, absolutely. I mean, children can learn from every single encounter with different kinds of materials, but we want to optimise children's learning and we want to give them the best opportunity we can to engage in the kinds of experiences that um, honour their rights. So to develop a quality visual arts experience, oh, pardon me, jumped ahead there. A quality visual arts experience relies on a belief that children are capable. 
And this is true for typically developing children as much as it is for children of determination or children with special rights. So it's a strength-based approach. It's not thinking about what the children can't do yet. It's thinking about what is possible for every single child. It requires respecting the child's voice, however their voice can be articulated, whether that's through words or gestures or facial expressions. It's about supporting the child to make meaning, to assist the child rather than direct, as we identified on the previous slide. It's about providing quality materials and processes. And it comes from a place where we're desiring relationship, not just relationship between yourself and your child, but also to support your child to have relationships with the environment, with materials, with other children, with other adults. So we're looking for those opportunities and those experiences that will foster getting to know your child really, really well and supporting them to have their voice heard, their ideas respected. It also requires a value for open-ended processes rather than what I would call close-ended or um, predetermined outcomes. So we really want to avoid trying to sit children down to make a product that looks like, um, you know, the caterpillar made out of the egg carton or the child's handprint on the page in a, in a pattern, as we saw on that previous slide with the handprint reindeers and so on. And we need to really value time for children to play and to explore all of the opportunities that we're presenting them. So that notion of time is very, very important. The educators in Reggio Emilia, which is a city in the north of Italy, um, where there's a, um, an early childhood approach in that part of Italy that, that does centralise creative arts and arts processes in the learning curriculum. And one of their educators, right at the beginning of their project, um, which began in after the Second World War, stated that the reason they centralised the arts in their learning was that they wanted to illustrate the extraordinary, beautiful and intelligent things children know how to do and to sweep away, or they hoped, that widespread work that seems to happen where teachers or adults' minds and hands are central and where children have a marginal role, which leads to stereotyped products for every child. And you've been, I'm sure you've seen in schools and early childhood centres, um, the identical product on the wall where every single child has been shown a template and expected to produce it. Now that's problematic for all children, regardless of their ability or their disability we need to make sure that whatever we're offering children illustrates the extraordinary, beautiful and intelligent things they know how to do and that cater to where they're at developmentally so that we're honouring them. So the problem with structured processes and products, as you see with the frogs behind you uh, on the screen, we need to ask with this kind of product, who is being entertained? Who's learning? Whose idea of a frog is being made? Because if this is to teach children about frogs, it's not going to teach them terribly much about real frogs. Whose hands, hearts and minds are central to this kind of process? And where is the voice of the child in this kind of experience? Does it capture their development, their ideas, their enjoyment of a process or a material? I don't think so. And so we need to ask where is the capable child in this kind of learning experience? So the question is really to ask, you know, every time you make a decision about the kind of arts experience to offer a child, we need to ask who is the artist going to be? If it requires the adult um, literally step by step forcing the process, then the adult is the artist and the child is, is like their paintbrush. You know, they're just really using the child to make something. It's adult controlled. 
Whereas if we look along the continuum, we really want to be aiming for experiences where the child is in control to the capacity of their development. And so if you see on Pinterest, for example, you might look on Pinterest for an idea for something for your child to do or, or another website, it's important to ask yourself, will my child be the artist in this experience or will I have to control the experience to end up with the, the ladybug foot or the you know, paper plate fish? So it's important to constantly ask ourselves that question and pull ourselves up short if we're imposing structured, template-driven, product-driven experiences onto children simply because we desire for them to be able to make a product. If it's not meaningful for the child, then it's really meaningless to the child. It's important to support a sense of wonder. And Rachel Carson says it so beautifully when she says, if a child is to keep alive their inborn sense of wonder, and no child is missing this sense of wonder, the child needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with the child the joy, the excitement, and the mystery of the world we live in. And to do that, we're fostering dispositions that support creativity. We're supporting processes of exploration and focus and curiosity and wonder. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the bit to press the next screen. There we go. So I want us to think about arts engagement as a human right. Not something that you're either born with or not born with. Not something that you're capable of or not capable of. Every human being has this right. Children have the right for, their, um, for us to support and respect their potential. We need to support children to be visible in their community. And what I mean by that, by being visible in a community, it means that children have a voice, children are noticed, children are not invisible. And too often in our big cities, children do not get a voice and they do not, they're not heard. Um, and often in the art making process, again, it's the adult's voice, the adult's activities that might be central. So we want to develop children's capacities to share their ideas or their body movements or their exploration with materials and processes rather than using the child as an implement for our own art making. And this is held up in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which says children have the right to relax and to play and to join in a wide range of cultural, artistic and other recreational activities. And again, I say no child um, should miss out on this right, regardless of their ability, disability, culture, socioeconomic status, all of the things that put people into compartments should not apply when it comes to the rights of, of humankind and particularly of children. So if we think about children with special rights or children of determination, we've also learned, this is a quote again from some of the educators associated with Reggio Emilia, and I will read it really slowly and I just want you to really stop and reflect on this quote and perhaps even insert your child into the quote. We've also learned that if we pay attention to the differences among children and in particular children with special rights, this is what uh, in Reggio Emilia, sorry to divert, children with uh, additional needs uh, or special needs as some people call it around the world, children who have determination in Reggio Emilia, they call these children children with special rights. And they don't mean that these children should get extraordinary rights above and beyond other children. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that if you require additional support, then that is a, a special right. If you do require additional supports to be given equal opportunities, then that's your special right. 
So we've also learned that if we pay attention to the differences among children, and in particular children with special rights, we can see that each child has a different way of being a child. It's important to let the children show us their approach to life. From their approach, we learn how to be with them. The children's approach to life is a kind of research to try and understand the world around them, a very human way to try to know. Our experiences with children with special rights have given quality to our work because we have become better observers. And I love the expression of ideas in that quote because what it's telling us is that we need to pay attention. We need to learn how to be with children and to cater to who they are rather than try and force them to bend to some ideal of humanity or what children should be doing at a particular age or stage. It's freeing to think that way. When children are respected, they have the right to shared exploration with a supportive protagonist adult, a person who's facilitating and supporting their learning. They deserve to experience quality materials and processes. Sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on my time. And they deserve to have their work valued and documented with respect, but valued most of all. I just wanted to share this little bit of documentation. So in early childhood centres, we document children's learning. We tell learning stories to share with families the wonder of children's development and achievements. And this is no less so for children of determination. This little boy that you see on the screen, and I have his mum's permission to use these images, um, which are about 10 years old now, so he's a teenager now. But he came to our centre with uh, a diagnosis of autism. And for this little fellow, standing still in one place was a real challenge. Um, staying anywhere for longer than about 30 seconds was a really big ask. And if he was um, encouraged to stay, for example, to listen to a story or, as you see in front of you, to even do anything at the art centre, he would often lash out and smack whoever was standing too close to him because of the sensory issues that he had. Anyway, we decided to introduce the children to charcoal. This was the children's first experience with charcoal and we made a decision that we would use charcoal for a month and not have anything else in the art centre with that idea that we need to take time to become confident with a material and to develop a relationship with materials, to learn what that material can do and how it can speak. As you can see, and if I could have done a video of it, the video would have gone for about 25 minutes. This little fellow was so engaged with the charcoal. He was reasonably interested with the marks it was making on the paper, but he was so much more interested in what it was doing in relationship with his hands. For us, this was... Uh, it was the most exciting moment because this was the first time we had seen Maddox focus, where he stayed focused for a long period of time, where he allowed other people to be within his vicinity who didn't get hit. So it was actually a really important learning experience for the little girl who was nearby him to, try to develop that trust, although she was so occupied with what she was doing that um, she was mesmerised by the affordances of charcoal as well. But I just wanted to put that notion of, you know, I said before, children have the right to have their learning celebrated. And so photographs of your child engaging in meaningful processes are as important uh, a witness to your child's joyful learning as any product that they might make. So we don't have to always be aiming for something that's going to hang on it on the gallery wall. I just wanted to come back to the value for time, just to really keep focusing on that notion that we don't want to separate learning and loving. We can't learn to play and love separately because 
the, that sort of relationship and play and experience has to all be part of the same process of learning. So let's think about some meaningful arts encounters. And obviously in future workshops, we'll go into much more detail about some of these, but how can we create that sense of wonder for our children? This is an ephemeral art experience which people could be immersed in at the Sydney Biennale, sorry. And so artful experiences, as I just said, don't always have to be making something. They can be an experience and an interaction with light and dark and shadow and wonder and just the delight of a meaningful encounter with, with artful materials and processes. So what are some of the possibilities we'll think about in coming workshops? You can, because often people rack their brains. What, what on earth can we do? What art experiences can we do? There's so much that we can do that is open-ended, that is rich with possibilities, rather than giving our children a template or a colouring in activity or something that's quite structured, which requires the adult to spend half an hour beforehand cutting all, out all of the bits and getting it all ready for the child to be forced to make. So we can do drawing, mark making with charcoal, inks, crayons, and the list is endless. But if you're doing drawing and mark making, choose materials that make a rich, meaningful mark, not something that's hardly visible on the page and not something that's so hard to apply that you need the strength of, you know, a, a muscle man to achieve it. If we're painting, we can paint with objects, with hands, with tools. We can use acrylic paints with a, which are plastic based, or we can use beautiful, rich, um, creamy watercolors. There's just so much you can use. Clay and Play-Doh for manipulatives. And clay, be careful, you know, for very young hands, it can be hard to manipulate. So make sure you're buying a good quality soft clay rather than the really hard air dry clays that tend to be sold more um, in craft stores and things like that. Um, down in the bottom right hand side, that's India ink applied with a stick. Um, children will be mesmerised and fascinated by that as much as they will be, for example, by the charcoal that you see up in the top right hand corner. Um, finger paint can be made out of corn flour and water and food colouring. So it's a really economical, non-toxic painting option for children with special rights. But we can also, as I showed you in that other photo, play with technology, with light, um, light boxes, shadows, cameras, even the photocopier can be a wonderful art media. We can engage children in sensory play experiences such as the goop you see down on the bottom right hand side of the screen, which is again, good old corn flour um, or starch, I think the Americans call it, mixed with water and dripping food dyes into it. And it has the most amazing texture. So lots of sensory play experiences are really important for young children. Um, loose parts and ephemeral art experiences. So collecting leaves, flowers, grasses, obviously being mindful of toxicity or if children are more likely to put things into their mouths, um, we're wanting to avoid that. But then we can do construction and gluing. We can do collage with glue and materials. Um, and printmaking. But obviously we can't um, encounter the full gamut of possibilities in one half hour workshop, but hopefully that's given you some stimulus that there is more than just painting and drawing. And a final reflection before we move to questions. This is John Dewey, who was a philosopher at the turn of the century. Um, and I draw a lot on, upon his old fashioned way of saying things. Um, it helps me to reflect and I hope it will support you in your reflection about how we choose quality arts experiences for our children. The child is the starting point, the centre and the end. The child's development, their growth is the ideal. So we need to be focused on their learning and development, not some pinnacle of performance. And literally, we must take our stand with the child and our departure from the child. 
It is the child, not the subject matter, not the activity, not the material, which determines both the quality and the quantity of the learning. And I just really want to encourage you as parents of whether they're typically or, or um, atypically developing children to really remember that your role is important in this, your choices um, in terms of honouring your child and giving voice to your child. That is what determines whether an experience will be a meaningful experience for your child. I just wanted to preempt in our next session, these are some of the things that we will specifically look at the next session I present this time next week, um, how to adapt any visual arts learning experience to suit a child's age, stage and ability. And again, learning how to identify, well, what does a rich arts-based, play-based play experience look like for all children? So I'll, I will leave the, um, I'll stop sharing my screen now and have a look at the chat and see if we've got any questions. We don't have any at this point, um, but please, if you do have specific questions, uh, type them into the chat. Oh, I've got, somebody's raised a hand. Let me have a look, I'm just pulling that up. Ah, uh, yes, I can't see your name, but if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Belis, can I ask you about something? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, if my uh, a child is uh, has uh, is uh, a boy is from uh, determination, yes, and he has uh, autistic disorder, mm -hmm. uh, and he has like uh, fourteen years. He's fourteen years old. Yeah. Yeah, but he not uh, nonverbal. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, I need to know any tips or uh, any something for people for determination to help and support him. If you can support me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, and my next workshop will focus more specifically on how to target an experience based on what you know about your child. Because it's always difficult for me, for example, it would be inappropriate for me to say, do this activity with your child, that will be perfect, because it might not be, you know, if, if he has particular sensory issues, or if he has particular smells he doesn't like, or feelings he will react to, then you know that. Um, so it's about learning how to choose the kinds of encounters with material that will support him to not just be comfortable, but to be willing to engage with it or even to focus on it for those few moments, even if it is just a few moments. Um, I would encourage you not to be stressed about making something, about creating a product, but at the same time, when you use beautiful, rich, meaningful materials, then any mark your child makes is going to be beautiful and something that you would celebrate. Um, I hope that helps, but I would encourage you to come to my next workshop because we will break down a little bit more. How can we observe the strengths and the capacities of our own individual children to then start thinking about how to um, plan an experience for them? And you told me what is the time for next uh, session for uh, your workshop? It'll be on the website. Um, so the people at Bright Start will have that advertised on the on the website, but it's exactly this time next week. Thank, thank you for, for helping us. I look forward to seeing you there. I've had a question from Hina. Uh, sometimes children want to do perfectly, but they can't and they become annoyed and think they're not capable to do art. Great question, how do we encourage them? I think the best way we encourage children is by modeling our own wonder and curiosity. So rather than pushing your child, if they're not ready to be engaged or they're nervous about getting it wrong, then what you do is you model that process. You can sit and play with the materials alongside them um, and you can even be saying things like, oh, I wonder what happens when I rub my hand on the chalk or the charcoal or, 
Oh, it's all over my hands. Look at that. I've made a big smudge on the paper. Oh, that's okay. I don't mind. That, that looks interesting. So you sort of, you're not, you're modelling acceptance of the efforts that children are making rather than identifying that they have to make it look a particular way or end up with a particular result. Because we want it to be that experimentation with materials. And, you know, the great thing about art making is that there is no right and wrong, especially when we choose open ended experiences. The problem with structured closed ended experiences is that they do make the child feel like a failure often because children at that age or that level of ability, wherever they're sitting along that continuum, it's not not necessarily related to age. It might be a 14 year old autistic boy or it might be a four year old girl. But if where they're at is that they're um, nervous about getting it right, then we need to start stepping back as adults, I think, and really start celebrating their, their efforts, their attempts, their engagements and accepting what they offer us rather than correcting them or fixing it. It's just the worst thing we can ever do is to step in and take over and fix it because the mess, because what fixing something does is it tells the child that their effort has, is not adequate and that you have to make it better. And straight away, that's what tells children that they're not measuring up to some idea that the adult has in their head. Um, I'll move on because I just want to make sure we cover anyone else who has questions. Dua, I think is your name. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing everything wrong. So somebody's asked, I have a two year old boy and a four year old girl. And I found it very difficult for both of them to do artwork at the same time. Usually I let the four year old do artwork only during her brother's nap. Any tips to help? And my boy too has a speech delay. Yeah, look, I think it's interesting, isn't it? I think that's wise if there are experiences that you want to do uh, with your four year old um, that and you don't want everything to be upended and the paint to be spread from one end of the house to the other, then choosing a time when it can just be a one on one experience with you is wise. At the same time, your younger little fellow, your two year old boy, um, there will be times and experiences that he can very happily join in on. So for example, if you were doing finger painting, then a two year old and a four year old will very happily do that alongside each other. Um, because again, we're not focusing on making a particular structured outcome. It's just the joy of the sensory process. And you know, you can be having conversations with them both at the same time. One thing I will add, and maybe it's something I can uh, make sure I put in a future session together is it's about what we need to do when we're planning is what I call mitigate for disaster. Um, when you're thinking about a learning experience, I want you to ask, um, I want you to ask what can go wrong? What might spill? What messes might we make? What might create catastrophe? And you sort of backtrack and you think, okay, well, how can I prevent that from being a problem? So for example, with the finger painting, let's do it outside where we can hose everybody down afterwards with the water. Or if we're doing a, um, a messy painting activity, let's put a tarpaulin down under the table. Let's have a bowl of soapy water nearby so that we don't have to walk all the way to the bathroom. Let's pop an apron on. And if children won't wear an apron, because I know many of them, regardless of ability or disability, many children, especially our under fours, um, don't like that feeling of putting an apron on, um, pop them in, into one of dad's big t-shirts or mum's big t-shirts and that will at least protect your clothing a little bit. So it's about thinking through all the things that could go wrong and sort of preventing that from happening by, by planning ahead. I hope that helps. Uh, Vishal, you've said your four-year-old daughter doesn't like doing uh, doesn't like anything with colour on her hands or her clothes. Oh, love, I didn't see that before I commented on the apron. She likes to be clean all the time. Again, in our next um, session next week, I'm actually going to share some examples for children who have that 
that really um, either tactile or that fear of getting messy. Um, there are ways that we can still give them quality arts experiences without it being a messy arts experience. Uh, so you can do things like um, painting with an implement, um, wearing rubber gloves, you know, the little disposable gloves. Some children will happily do an experience if they've got some gloves on. Um, I'm also going to share some images in the third um, session we do around um, planning for experiences where we can um, paint behind a surface or onto a different surface. Sometimes that's attractive enough to sort of get them over that nervousness about getting dirty. So there are ways to get across that. But again, I think you as the adult model, that is going to be the best way to build your daughter's willingness to maybe even get a little tiny bit dirty and not be so afraid of that. Sometimes children's fear of mess or getting their hands dirty actually comes because the adults in their lives are always telling them that, no, no, don't touch that, don't do that, don't, you know, and it sort of puts up barriers for children where they think they're going to get in trouble if they get, if they make anything dirty. So you getting your hands dirty as you play with materials alongside your children, that's always a good strategy as well to help them to realise that it's not the end of the world if you get a bit of colour on your hands and it can actually be fun. Um, Moza, my kids may start drawing as little artists, but most of the time they don't finish. Is that meaning something unfinished work? No, it doesn't mean anything. Um, again, does it, who, who says when an artwork is finished, you know? So it's, we only get that notion that something doesn't finish if we have an idea in our heads of what it's supposed to look like when they're finished. Whereas if we come back a few steps and just see all art encounters as an opportunity to meet and play with materials, and that's enough. You know, we, we, I think we put so much pressure on our children um, at a very young age to be performing in certain ways and to get ahead of their peers and to be competitive at school that it's just delightful to let them experience something where there is no right and wrong, where there is no end point that's determined by anyone other than the child. So art making is such a precious experience for children and it's why many children love the art time at school because it's often the one time in their week that they get to be in charge of anything and make any kinds of creative decisions. So accept their work, celebrate their work. I mean, if children are coming up and going scribble, scribble and then running away, then, you know, I've got strategies that I can support you with as parents around extending. But again, your role as the adult is what will determine um, your child's engagement many, much of the time. Um, because if you can be there saying, oh, I'm just going to try this now, often you working alongside your children. I know that as a preschool teacher, when I sat at the table with children and engaged in the experiences, then they would stay much longer and be much more engaged than if they were at a table by themselves and I was busy on the other side of the room. So that notion of taking the time that it, that to build that relationship, not just with the materials and the process, but with the people that you're working with, that's the key, I think. Ah, oh, sorry, I hadn't seen the Q&A, Hara. So um, how could we, how we could know that our baby has a love for art things? Oh, good question. Watch them. Um, are they interested when you give them lovely chalk to, to rub on the front pathway or the driveway at home? Um, you know, if you make some, do they love cooking with you? If children love cooking with you, then they will love something like finger paint where you're mixing the, the starch with the water and stirring it. So there's just so, children, it's rare for children not to enjoy um, art making. And you can start right from when children are babies. Um, I encourage that with my teacher education students and whenever I speak with parents, there's not an age at which children are suddenly ready to learn art. Children are ready to learn 
from the minute they're born. In fact, they've started learning before they were born um, in terms of brain development. So if we want children at five years of age to be good at clay, at making something out of clay, for example, then they need to know what clay does. They need to be in a relationship with clay. And that meeting with clay can happen as soon as you can hold your head up and reach out and feel it and touch it and poke it. And that's an art experience. Okay, I want, I really want us to get beyond this idea that an art experience is making something that will be put on display. An art experience is an encounter and a relationship with materials. That for me, with young children, that's my focus around visual arts. Yes, they can end up making the most magnificent products and I'll share you images of some of them in future weeks. But it is about building a relationship with materials and exploring and wondering and experimenting. These are all dispositions that create um, a love of learning, creativity, and the willingness to learn not just art, but language, numeracy, science, music. When we integrate the arts into children's learning experiences, then for me, it guarantees a quality, rich experience. Hara, are there any other questions? I can't see any. Let me just double check the chat. Ah, yes, I've already seen those two questions. Well, if there aren't any other questions, how's our time going, Hara? Oh, maybe there's another one. Yes, are there any materials suitable for two-year-old babies? Absolutely. Um, so in that PowerPoint that I shared with you, pretty much every arts experience that you might offer to a four-year-old, you can then plan what you would offer to a baby or a toddler. And in fact, that is exactly what I am um, presenting on this time next week, is how do you deconstruct an arts experience so that you can create that encounter, that experience for children, whether they are a baby, whether they are an eight-year-old with disabilities, whether they um, have had experience with a material before or not. Um, so there's just so much. Oh, how could we know? Yes, I've seen that one. Yes, yes. Okay, I think that we're probably to the end of our time. So thank you so much for, for joining this initiative. Um, it's such an honour for me to be able to share some of my work and my research with you and to encourage you. Um, the job you're doing as parents, I'm a mum myself, um, mine are all grown up and living in different cities now, but I love seeing them and you never stop being their parent. Um, I just really want to encourage you, parenting is tough work and parenting at home um, without all of the different supports that you would normally be used to can get frustrating. Um, but I hope that I've encouraged you to sort of re-look at what quality arts experiences look like for young children and um, we'll look forward to an ongoing conversation. Please have a close look at the handout that you have access to in relation to this webinar. Um, I've also put some hyperlinks there for some additional information, some additional sources that you might like to explore and start gathering ideas from. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.